Hey everyone, I'm Anita Sharma. Welcome to Market Call. Jeffrey Olin is our special guest today. He's the president and CEO of Vision Capital. He will be taking your calls, emails, and tweets on real estate stocks. One of our favorite subjects here. Calls toll free, 1-855-326-6266. Our email address, marketcall at BNM Bloomberg. .ca. Jeffrey, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. You bet. Always. Uh, so, of course, we're on Fed Watch. We're waiting for uh, 2 o'clock Eastern to see what exactly the Fed does. We are expecting, what, a 25 basis point uh, rate cut. Uh, I want to first get your thoughts on that before we delve into the impact, potentially, on real estate. Well, there's a lot of champions for this rate cut. Certainly, our view on uh, interest rates is not something within our expertise. We're pretty focused on our niche, but uh, it's questionable whether you need it at this juncture. A yeah. uh, common mantra would say a decline in interest rates is positive real estate since it relies on a lot of mortgage money and the cost right. of that mortgage debt is lower. It's certainly positive for the housing market, uh, generally speaking. Um, and so generally it's a positive framework. However, we don't believe in terms of our space in publicly traded REITs rising or declining interest rates is nearly the material factor that the mantra uh, suggests that it is. We think supply and demand is a more critical factor. Okay, so let's delve deeper into that with respect to supply and demand. Let's start, you know, it really is a location, location, location story as far as real estate goes. How do you find the Canadian market thus far? And if you want to break that down even further, go right sure. ahead. Uh, I mean, presently and for some time, uh, we've been positive on really three sectors of the real estate okay. market. Rental apartments, and we can come back to each one of these if you like, sure. but rental apartments, um, there's a lot of powerful demographic and secular forces supporting this. Industrial real estate, all the pain in retail real estate is benefiting industrial, e-commerce related, logistics related real estate. Um, and in Canada, seniors housing. We have primarily North American focus. There's a little oversupply in seniors housing in the U.S., but mm -hmm. Canada looks pretty good. So those are the asset classes we like. Uh, we are less constructive on retail. We okay. think the pain in retail is early, and so we call industrial the new retail. All right, so if you're calling industrial the new retail, are you seeing a lot of evidence of the fact that maybe uh, areas, uh, especially REITs that are, are more fo have been focused traditionally on that uh, more retail space, they are moving more towards uh, capturing the industrial side or perhaps a mixed-use uh, dwelling situation with uh, senior living? Well, industrial certainly has been a, a strong asset class. I mean, vacancy rates are low. Yeah. T take Toronto, where we are sure. sitting right now. You had rental rates for industrial real estate ranging between $5 and $5.50 a square foot forever. Yeah. For 10 years, right. it didn't move. Right. In the last three years, they're up 90%. Wow. Vaughan, Ontario, now higher than $10 a square foot retail. For Sorry, for industrial real estate. And so the Amazons, the FedExes, the change in the supply chain is significant. Uh, a buzzword has become reverse logistics. I think if you go into a store and you buy something, yeah. there's an 8% chance you're going to return it. If you buy something online, there's a 30% likelihood that you're going to return it. Where does that go? It goes to the warehouse. And so you need a significant amount of warehouse space to service e-commerce. And unless you think e-commerce as a percentage of total retail sales is going to stop and decline, we think it's very early and supply is manageable in most markets globally. Jeffrey, let's uh, delve deeper now into the uh, apartment building space. Uh, I remember interviewing Ed Sunshine uh, some time ago uh, from Rio Can, about nine months ago, and his major concern, it was right when the uh, the Conservative government uh, was elected. Uh, but right ahead of that, he said he was quite concerned because as much as he and folks like him want to build more apartment building uh, dwellings, if you will, for folks uh, for, to, to satisfy uh, that component, he was finding that it was a really tough space to operate in. What are your thoughts on that are you you're clearly bullish on that in that space is it to your benefit is it to your benefit to not see uh, a lot of building in this area I mean obviously you're dealing with a massive massive uh, lack of supply issue right it's been a boon yeah. for 30 years for Canadian apartment REITs uh, take Canadian apartment properties REIT uh, a lot of folks shied away from building new for two generations sure. because of rent controls. Yeah. And yet, if you're a skilled operator and you understand the regulations and you can operate and respect the rule of law and regulation and yet find ways to improve your buildings, invest them and get a return by increased rents for that, you can do very well. The government has relaxed 
some of those parameters mm -hmm. that Mr. Sunshine uh, was concerned Especially about. Especially on the new build side. On the new build yeah. side, which is a supply issue. Yeah. And so there are very powerful demographic and secular forces supporting this. What do I mean? Uh, young adults getting married later. They right. live in apartments. They're having children later. In they live the in condos. apartments. Yeah, you're right. They want, urban lifestyle is trumping the need or desire to buy a house. They want to live downtown. They want to walk to work. Many don't have cars. Some don't have driver's licenses. So this is powerful. I thought that was a Canadian story, you know, the, the urban center uh, sprawl, if you will. And specifically, I thought that was a Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver story. But I just looked at the stats. Uh, a new survey came out, uh, I believe it was yesterday, in the States where more and more Americans now are also embracing that quote-unquote urban inner city living. Uh, Absolutely. It used to be the, the exurbs or the suburbs, right? I mean, it, absolutely the case. Even in where they have a long way to go, but even in places, you know, burned out downtown Detroit. Yes. I mean, if you, you know when the last time you're Detroit, but there's a resurgence, there's an investment. Inner city, middle America, there's a recognition that quality of life is enhanced if you have vibrant downtown urban centers. And that's where, you know, the you know, young urban folks want to live. And the other end of the spectrum, the aging the population, right? The leading edge of the baby boom turned 75 in 2021. They're transitioning from homes to rental apartments. So we see long-term secular trends that are very bullish for the rental apartment sector. It's funny because the demographers uh, going back about 15 years, they were calling on the baby boomers back then to sell their houses and get into these spaces you're talking about. But who would do that when you had just massive upside with, you know, with respect to your uh, housing just going through the roof uh, on the appreciation side? We're out of time for this segment. We could talk about this forever, but let's take a break. We're coming back with Jeffrey Olin. He's the president and CEO of Vision Capital. We're discussing real estate. Give us a call, one 855 Five three two six six two six six. Welcome back. We are with Jeffrey Olin. Jeffrey, let's start with an email from Tammy. She's in Calgary, Alberta. She's curious about CT Real Estate Investment Trust. What do you think of this going forward? She asks to collect a safe and predictable monthly distribution along with just a bit of a capital gain. Okay, well, there's a big picture and a specific stock request there. Right. A big picture I'll touch on briefly, and if right. we have more time, perhaps we can come back to it. Firstly, we don't believe in buying any security, real estate security or any other asset class, primarily for yield. Uh, we're total return investors. If you're in the REIT space, there seems to be one month every year where the stock prices go down and kill your yield for the year. Yeah. That's a general framework. We can come back to that. Within CT REIT, there's a little difference there. It's more bond-like. It's very high quality. This is CT, is Canadian Tire. This is a REIT which Canadian Tire sponsored to spin out their real estate that own Canadian Tires, either standalone or part of uh, center, community centers, and enter into long-term lease with Canadian Tire. So it's a very high quality covenant, uh, very stable, the yield is safe, um, and it's more bond-like, and there's some growth embedded in there, very solid management. Uh, this would be a hold for us. It's very stable, sleep at night. If your question is, can you rely on the yield and maybe get some capital gains, the answer is yes. Okay, when you think of a bond proxy, you normally think of the, the BCEs of the world, uh, but here you go, uh, CT rate uh, definitely on your list. With respect to that, thank you so much. Jeffrey, let's get to the phones now. Stephen in Calgary. Hi, Stephen. Hi there, Anita. First rate show. Thank you, Jeffrey, sir. Jeffrey, I wanted to get your thoughts on Minto Apartment REIT, uh, especially the uh, management and uh, the location of the uh, assets as well as their quality. Thanks very much. Well, you get a check mark on all those questions. Uh, management <laughs> is outstanding. Uh, this is a new REIT, but the sponsors of the REIT have been involved in this asset class since the 1950s. They're very knowledgeable. Uh, people, the very uh, honorable people, uh, high quality apartments in Toronto, in Ottawa in particular, maybe today the highest quality uh, of, of the apartment space in Canada. Oh, wow. um, they're in the right markets, they have some growth upside. Um, it's, you know, stock price has done uh, well in the last number of uh, weeks and so, but this is something that on a long-term basis you can put away and it's safe uh, and I think I answered most of your specific sub-questions, but yeah, this is, uh, we hold it, we own it, we like it. All right, bullish on Minto. Let's uh, skip over to Greg in Edmonton. Hi, Greg. 
Greg, are you there? Okay. The industrial we read. Need- I don't know. Does Jeffrey know if this is a Canadian company? I believe that it was. They have instituted a 15% withholding tax, and this name has underperformed the space so far year to date. Okay. Would you continue to hold, or do you have something better that you would suggest? Uh, well, WPT is an industrial space, mm-hmm. so we touched on that briefly at the beginning right. of the show. We like the space. Uh, we do like management. Uh, Minneapolis-based folks, uh, we know them well. They're solid people. Um, this is a Canadian REIT, but all of their assets are in the United States. So one of those handful of REITs that are, we tend to like these because they're off the radar screen from the Americans and uh, they tend to be relatively undervalued. This to us is a hold. Uh, we like the space, uh, we like management. Their particular markets are more in the Midwest where they're not land constrained, so okay. there's ability to create new supply, whereas other markets have more constraints. Uh, and so this is a whole, there be other names. We would like Dream Industrial REIT uh, at this juncture better than WPT if you're looking for Canadian REIT. And we have a lot of investments in the United States. We think some of the U.S. names, uh, Liberty Property Trust is a bigger name, which there's some catalyst to surface value. So we like the space. It's a hold. All right. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Back to the phones. David in Truro, Nova Scotia. Hi, David. Yes, hi. Thank you for my call. My question is regarding Tricon. Mm-hmm. Um, I got it in at a little over eleven dollars, and I'm kind of disappointed it slid down under under ten right. and hanging around there. And I thought possibly with the um, they got good assets and that, I guess, but also with the lower interest rates uh, looking or looming, that uh, the REITs would be a little stronger. Do you own it? Do you like it? And could you tell me what was the uh, nine to ten percent drop uh, caused by. I'll hang yeah. up and listen. Yeah, sure. So Tricon, firstly, outstanding management, really solid management, really solid board of directors, good governance here. They've done a couple of large transformative transactions the last couple of years, one of them most recently, and the market's still working through this. So they acquired, they did a trend, they, they were known or perceived, rightly or wrongly, to be a pure play, single family residential, renting homes in the United States, a burgeoning asset class. And they did a transformative transaction that expanded their definition of residential real estate to buy apartments, high quality apartments in the Sun Belt uh, through a Starlight, was a, uh, a Daniel Drimmer controlled entity, which was a limited partnership. And so what's happened here is you have some short term pain here because the Starlight, which was a private limited partnership, not public. Uh, they are, the Starlight Limited Partner Holders are getting shares of Tricon. Right. Some of them may not know what Tricon is, some of them may like it, some may not like it, but you're going to have a supply of shares coming to the market from Starlight unit holders that now have Tricon stock. That's one issue in the short term. The other thing, well, they're very solid management, high quality. Uh, they suffer from a bit of over leverage. Now, too much debt. No, we don't, th- they don't think they have too much to debt. As real estate guys, I agree with them. But the fact is, if you compare Tricon to other U.S. entities in similar spaces, they have much lower debt levels. So as a public entity, they need to uh, position themselves with lower leverage over the time before that marginal U.S. institution is going to consider a materially invest a material investment in Tricon. But great people, they have great global institutional relationships supporting them, um, and it, it's again, it's a fine, a fine uh, company. What's your relationship with leverage, especially when you see interest rates continuing to drop? Um, you know, w- is it your friend? Like, can, can you continue to play the market? Can you continue you to? You need to manage it yeah. appropriately. Uh, we think there's too much focus on how much debt you have as a percentage of the asset value, 70% loan to value, 60%, 80%. Right. We think there should be more focus on what's known as the interest coverage ratio. How much income do you have to cover that debt payment? So I started my career in the real estate industry in the 80s yeah. and Cadillac Fairviews, Trizex, Bramley's, Olympia, they all operated at 1.1 times interest coverage ratios. That was pretty narrow. Wow. Today, <laughs> REITs operate three, three yeah. and a half, four to one. 
that's comfortable. And when you consider there's longer term debt, that's another factor. Is it short term? Do you have exposure of that debt being called the next 30 days, or has it got a term of seven to 10 years? So those are some of the factors related to the leverage question. Right, so you definitely have to uh, just uh, delve deeper into the papers there with respect to the company or the REIT. Okay, Jeffrey, uh, great job there. Coming back with Jeffrey Olin, President and CEO of Vision Capital. We're on real estate today, 1-855-326-6266. Welcome back. We are with Jeffrey Olin. Another email for you, Jeffrey. Uh, the West likes you. Let's get to Patrick. Actually, this is from Toronto, but Boardwalk Real Estate Investment uh, is what we're looking at here. Your opinion on this, the play on Western Canada, does it have any upside? We talked about this off air. What's your, what's your take on that right now? You know, we like Boardwalk. Um, it's clearly been challenged by the dominant position it has in Western Canada. We've been very close with Boardwalk for many years. Um, my colleague, partner Frank Mara and I helped sponsor this when it was in its nascent days. So we've known the management for very well. They're very solid people. Uh, it's a large cap uh, REIT. Um, you know, it is a bet right now, rightly or wrongly, in terms of review in Calgary and Edmonton. And in our view, the pricing of this REIT at this juncture is a fairly safe entry point. Certainly the value of the real estate, the net asset value, and that's our religion, net asset value compared to the stock price, is trading at a discount. Uh, there's a big short position in this REIT mm -hmm. by Americans, which we think is bullish because they got to buy back that short position. Um, it has a 2.4% dividend yield to add to this picture. Uh, around $40, $41, it's hard to think you're going to get hurt owning Boardwalk REIT. What do you think of the whole Calgary play right now? I mean, if they, there's some rumblings that, you know, forget about oil and gas, they could move towards a more fintech situation, really build the infrastructure out for that. That would only be bullish for a company like a Boardwalk, right? Yeah, again, from a real estate perspective, uh, we, like, we like the apartment space. We hate the office space forget what happened in Calgary, you had too many office buildings being built and supply and demand trumps interest rates, supply, trumps location, location, location. In our view, it's going to be at least 10 years before the Calgary office market recovers. I don't wow. care what happened to the economy. Too many buildings when they didn't need them. So that's our view. In terms of big picture, I don't want to get too political outside, but we think J what Jason Kenney is, is doing is wonderful for Alberta. It's great for the real estate space and it's great for Canada. Uh, it's a breath of fresh air in our view, and that's positive to the Alberta-based real estate names. Okay, let's see how all that continues to play out. In the meantime, let's get you another email. Karen, she would like to know about the H&R uh, rate, your opinion on this. Would it be a good investment at this time, she asks, for a long-term hold, and is the dividend safe? Yeah, H&R is a bit of an enigma. It's a large cap, granddaddy REIT in space. Uh, Hofstetter family is at the helm there. Um, the dividend is safe. Uh, it's a diversified REIT, which are things that, you know, Americans don't like very much because they want to have office there and retail here, et cetera. They want to do that picking. Um, it's large. They've been talking about trying to do strategic things for some time. They haven't done anything material. Uh, they're encumbered because they own, as part of that diversified office, uh, retail, residential, they've got a little of a lot. Um, they have a big position in something called Primaris, which used to be a public entity. It's a large community, Class B, A minus shopping centers. They have some issues in managing that big retail presence in Primaris. So it's not a favorite name for ours right now, but Tom Hofster is a smart guy. If he can actually pull the trigger on something strategic, they have a great US apartment portfolio, right. which they can service value on and create some value. Uh, if he does some of these things, uh, you might get a surprise in HR REIT, but it's not a favorite name of ours right now for the reasons we discussed. Okay, let's see what you think about this uh, next one. For that, we'll go back to the phones and we'll bring in Mike from Vancouver. Hi, Mike. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Um, I had a question about American hotel income properties. Um, I just want to know your overall thoughts, and they just sold a bunch of their um, lower. Um, and hotels, and they're going to invest that in higher in hotels. And it pays a dividend in U.S. funds, so mm -hmm. I just want to know what its thoughts were. Yeah, we, this would be a sell for us. Uh, you know, we generally, just to clarify, we're not big hotel guys at any point in the cycle. 
uh, you can make the best real estate deal in the world, and if you're lousy operators, you're going to lose money. You got a new tenant every day, um, and so. It, you've got to really look at the operator. There's a poor alignment here, poor governance. Uh, the REIT has suffered from that in our view. Uh, externally managed uh, for some time, and so a lot of uh, acquisitions were done where the alignment between uh, management wasn't there. They were getting compensated by uh, fees. Um, the whole story of this read at the outset, these railway uh, hotels, they just announced, that was at the outset, the IPO, they announced they are selling. And if you look at the price they're selling them at uh, versus the price they bought them at, it's not a particularly compelling story. So this is, they're overpaying their distribution. This is, in our view, has not been a good investment. Uh, you see it on the screen there. Mm. And something we would Falling continue to avoid. Are they getting into branded hotels at this juncture? Not sure it's the right point in the cycle to be doing that. Okay. Let's uh, squeeze in a couple more calls here. We'll get to Peter in Vancouver. Hi, Peter. Oh, thank you for taking my call. Jeffrey, where have you been? <laughs> the last time you appeared on BNN was in December 2011. You got a great reputation. Thank you, I've Peter. I've been waiting to see you. So today I'm very happy to listen to your expert advice. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Things have changed so much. You look at Anita. He's new, very good, and always interacting with the And she knows a lot about real estate, too. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. You guys know I love real estate. So, Jeffrey, can I ask, get your expert advice on Summit? Read. Thank you very much. We hope to see you again, Jeffrey. Thank You're you, Peter. You're looking good. He'll Thanks. be back, Peter. He'll be Thanks back. Thanks for your comments and your question. So Summit is a very, again, it's in the industrial space. Yeah. We like. I'll give you a sound bite. For, okay. three, for uh, every square feet of retail space uh, to, you need, uh, sorry, every square feet of warehouse space yeah. to service a retailer, you need three square feet of industrial space to service an e-commerce oh, retailer, wow. okay? You think about it, we tour a lot of real estate. If you tour a warehouse to service a store, you find skids and pallets. If you tour a warehouse to service e-commerce, you find par parcels and packages. Uh, so this is in that realm. And Summit's right in the heart of this dynamic. It's high quality real estate, mm -hmm. great management. Uh, this is a management team that Summit is an old name. They serviced value once in this space before. Uh, they're in the right markets. Uh, Toronto in particular, the big presence of high quality logistics related real estate here, some data center. The valuation is rich at this juncture. So we buy like it. Buy this on a dip, maybe? You buy this on a dip. It's trading at a 20 to 30% premium to net asset value, forward looking. It's not cheap, it's good quality, uh, you have a long-term perspective, okay, but there's probably, at this juncture, we think Dream Industrial Reed is probably better value, but Summit is a fantastic entity. Um, and in terms of then takeout M&A, it's hard to think at this premium that it's gonna have much takeout premium as well. You know what, we might have to uh, throw up a chart of Dream. We're gonna take a break, we're gonna come back, let our control room figure that out, because you mentioned it a couple of times, so we'll show that for our viewers. We'll come back with Jeffrey Olin. We're on Real Estate, he's from Vision Capital. Our number, one. 855-326-6266. Peter alluded to it. Uh, Jeffrey Olin, it's the first time you've been here since we've uh, joined forces with Bloomberg. We want to know more about your uh, investment strategy, get our viewers to uh, uh, reacquaint themselves with you if we can, Jeffrey. But first, you brought up a couple of REITs uh, throughout the course of the show uh, that you're bullish on. Let's talk a little bit more about these. Uh, we'll start with Dream. Sure. So Dream Industrial REIT, because yeah. there's a few Dream entities, so be cautious about okay. that. Not We don't mind Dream Office either. Dream Unlimited is another one. Dream Hard Asset Alternatives. There's a number <laughs> of dreams. A little as bit of a they don't, situation happening. As long here. as they don't yeah. turn into nightmares, we're good. Um, <laughs> but Dream Industrial REIT, D-I-R uh, dot U-N, again, in the industrial space, uh, which we like it, we think it's reasonably reasonable value at this juncture, it is certainly one name. It has a nice yield to it. Uh, it's been a good performer over the last mm, year. Uh, we think it's lagged some of the uh, you know, movement in some of the other REITs. Another one, again, we're North American focused. 
uh, probably our favorite name right now in the industrial space, which is one of our favorite spaces, is Liberty Property Trust. So this is a larger entity, uh, five, six billion market cap in, and maybe higher in the United States. Um, we think it's worth close to $60, so it's rare at this juncture you're going to get a publicly traded industrial REIT trading at a discount to the underlying value of the real estate. There's no asset value. Here's one, and there's some activism okay. taking place. Jonathan Litt is in the press about the encouraging to consider a sale. One of the reasons it's lagged is they used to have office and industrial and they're transforming itself to be a pure play industrial read and people have taken a bit of a wait lead see look on that. They're going to do it and they're going to be largely be done that by the end of this year. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for bringing both of these uh, rates uh, and stocks to our attention. Now let's go back to something you touched on earlier as well. You were talking about just the whole e-commerce space, just how that continues to grow by leaps and bounds. And you're keeping a very close eye on the square footage space as a result. Yeah, I mean, uh, as I think I touched on earlier, yeah. the growth in e-commerce sales as a percentage of total retail sales is a direct driver for this space. The demand from the Amazons and Federal Expresses mm -hmm. of the world is voracious. And we watch supply. It's easy to build this stuff, but it's not so easy to get the land zoned in the right location where these users want to be. The big discussion in the Fortune 1000 boardroom is supply chain management. Mm -hmm. If you look at the costs of supply chain management, 60% is transportation, 30% is labor and working capital, only 6% is rent. So getting the right form of real estate in right location is critical to driving 94% of your costs. Let's throw up a graph. Uh, you supplied us with a graph uh, to take a closer look at this space. And you've gone back some years, right, yes. uh, to basically break this down for us. So I'll we'll throw this up for our viewers. Explain what we're looking at. Uh, well, this is exactly what the projection is. For right. every $1 billion of e-commerce sales, it's expected to create the demand for 1.25 million square feet of industrial real estate, this wow. warehouse space. And so, you know, it sounds like a big number, 1 billion e-commerce sales, but just look at Amazon sales or growth in sales, you can see, and it's early days in the supply chain repositioning. Amazon's been working on this long time, mm -hmm. but part of the pain in retail is a lot of traditional retailers haven't figured out the supply chain movement yet. Right. And so we think in the projections, and they're not our numbers, uh, but industry statistics that show you over the next few years, a pretty significant increase in demand. And if supply is measured and you have demand, that's a formula we like. Increasing demand with restrictions on supply. All right. So very bullish moving forward then. Okay. Jeffrey, thank you for breaking this all down for us. We really You're appreciate welcome. it. Let's take another break here on Market Call. You're watching BNM Bloomberg. Jeffrey Olin is the president and CEO of Vision Capital. We are discussing real estate stocks today. Get your calls in. We're returning to them next. 1-855-326-6266. Jeffrey Olin picking his brain during the commercial break. Let's get to Angela in Brampton, Ontario. Hi, Angela. Uh, good afternoon, Anita. Uh, my question for Jeffrey is, um, what, do you th what is his opinion on Morgard, uh, particularly going forward? Right. I know that they've had uh, uh, you know, a, a few interesting things just come up just recently. So if you could just comment on some of the recent um, uh, happenings over there. Angela, before you go... Uh, there's three Morgards, so I want to get you the right answer to the right question. There's Morgard Corp, Morgard REIT, and Morgard North American Residential REIT. Which one is of interest to you? The second. Morgard Corp? REIT. Morgard REIT. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. So Morgard REIT uh, is a REIT that's been challenged uh, primarily because of their property types which they're invested in. So they have a lot of that challenge retail space we've been talking about. Um, uh, Brampton City Center, what do they call them all out there in Brampton? 
uh, is one of their assets. So they, ha they have some challenged uh, Bramley City Center. Oh, okay. Thinking, yeah. Bramley City Center. Uh, they have some challenged retail assets in a challenging retail market. They also have office, which is not one of our favorite asset classes. So they're in two asset classes okay. that we don't really like, and it's externally managed by Morgard Corp, where there's a fee stream that's completely not aligned uh, to the minority unit holders in terms of how they compensate management. They don't have internal management. So we tend to shy away from most externally managed REITs. You'd be better off to buy Morgard Corp. Okay. Which owns 50% of Morgard REIT, collects the fees from Morgard REIT, has a more diversified portfolio, including residential assets in Toronto and the United States, gets those fees, um, and now you have alignment. Uh, Mr. Ray Sahi controls both, but you have at the parent company level, and that's worth $250 to $300 a share, and it's trading around $180 a share. So Morgard REIT, stay away. Morgard Corp, not that liquid, but you can sleep at night, put that one away. It's interesting. We had David Baskin on last night, uh, and not last night, but in previous uh, in a previous uh, show, he did mention to me. Look, he's bullish on Morgard, and he was frustrated as to why the public couldn't uh, couldn't get behind Mr. Sahi and what he's trying to do there with Morgard. So your play is to go through the corp. Yeah, I mean, full disclosure. I mean, we own Morgard Corp. It was one of our largest holdings yeah. for five years, but we haven't owned it for a couple of years. Uh, primarily because, one, the stock did very well. It went from 40 to 180. Uh, we bought it at 40. We thought it was worth 90. And now, as I said, the 180 is probably 250. Um, so it's traded a discount to NAV, but it will always trade at a, a discount, discount to net asset yeah. value because it's a controlled vehicle. It's very illiquid. It's diversified. And so, and at this juncture, through Morgard REIT, and they own office and retail, not our favorite asset classes. Okay, Jeffrey, thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Back to Calgary and Rom. Hi, Rom. Hi, Could Rom. I ask about, could I ask about the largest? This is uh, one of the industrial REIT and uh, has been uh, since uh, December shooting up like a rocket. Uh -huh. And it always has been very expensive. What is your opinion about this one, or would you prefer some other cheaper REIT which will give a better return, industrial only, in U.S.? Thanks a lot for your thoughts. Thank sir. you for your question, Ram. I mean, Prologis is an incredible, uh, incredible yeah. uh, REIT. It, it's one of the finest management teams in real estate in the planet. It's a $40 billion market cap. New York Stock Exchange is the yeah. largest industrial logistics company in the world. Uh, they benefit from the footprint uh, globally. It was a large holding of vision for many years. We did trim Prologis recently around 84 US because of value, because of exactly what you said. It's done extremely well. You will likely come back into the stock, but today we think that, uh, as I said, Liberty is, is a better name in the United States. Uh, we like Dream Industrial here in Canada. Uh, on just on valuation, but in terms of quality of real estate, quality of management, uh, in right in the middle of this transition supply and change we talked to, Prologis is the go-to name. It's just a little expensive right now in our view. They have a billion dollar value add platform that gets no value in the stock. And add to that the news today, just acquiring IPT assets, a $4 billion merger, rock and roll for rock Prologis. Roll. A bit too late, though, to jump on that uh, train. Uh, it's you come like back dream, a little like bit. Liberty. Yeah, yeah, we like them. We'll be back in Prologis at some juncture, but not right now. Where would you get in? High 70s. Okay. All right. High 70s. We're at about uh, 82 right now. Joel in Toronto. How are you? Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, excellent program, Anita. Thank and, you, sir. And uh, I'm calling about uh, Plaza Retail Re. Um, one question in specific, I'm just curious as to their uh, P.E. ratio is 14 times. Um, your preference. I'm sure your preference is lower, but is 14 a uh, fair valuation and your uh, opinion on the stock? Thanks very much and have a wonderful day. All right, so, thanks, Joel. Firstly, your question referred to P.E. ratio, price 
to earnings ratio. Uh, if that was an accurate reflection of your correction, I need to frame that because in real estate, the more relevant metric is price to cash flow or FFO, funds from operations, or AFFO, adjusted funds from operations. Those are technical terms. But cash flow is more critical in real estate because of the high amount of depreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's qualify that, that you should be looking more at cash flow multiples or price to FFO. We like Plaza, uh, you know, it's in that space we don't like retail. Management though is, is just stellar. You have Michael Zakuda, there's nobody better, uh, certainly in Canada, few on the planet as good as what he does is Michael Zakuda, the CEO, uh, and he's highly aligned with ownership. Uh, he has a niche which is primarily uh, smaller centers in Atlantic Canada where he does a lot of development, creates value, is not a coupon clipper. It's challenged, it's certainly undervalued. There's a nice dividend to this, 6.6%, .6%, I believe, dividend yield. It's not a most liquid stock, but they own, develop, strip plazas, a few enclosed malls, primarily Eastern Atlantic Canada. You can sleep at night owning this. There's higher growth entities out there, but if you wanna be exposed to retail, uh, this is a good name. All right. I know our viewers are uh, immensely enjoying your analysis, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for this. Let's take another break here. You're watching Market Call on b and Bloomberg. We're coming back, though, with Jeffrey Olin, President and CEO of Vision Capital. We're on Real Estate, 1-855-326-6266. Four more calls, Jeffrey, we can do it. Let's get to uh, Jaffer in Vancouver. Hi, Jaffer. Oh, thank you for taking my call. How about you guys today? Doing well, sir. What's your question? Uh, Jeffrey, uh, my name in Iranian is Jaffer, so it's a very good tweet. Thank you. True North Apartment REIT. It okay, we actually have uh, him calling in for Allied property. So, okay. Yeah. Maybe we should stick with Allied. All right, Allied Property REIT. Allied Property REIT is a $6 billion market cap REIT with a 3.3% dividend yield. Uh, it's a pure play office REIT that created a new asset class, which is they refer to as Class I office property. So those of you familiar with Toronto, it's all that brick and beam stuff between University Avenue and Bathurst Street that they've done an incredible job in converting from old warehouse space to office space. So it's unique asset class. They're in heavily concentrated in Toronto where the supply and demand fundamentals are favorable. You can, uh, we like Allied Reed. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Let's get to Caroline in Burnaby. Hi, Caroline. Hi there. I hold uh, Rio Can and in my portfolio for a long time. I see the stock price doesn't go anywhere. It, um, I'm even down from my cost base, and um, it pays a 5% dividend, and that's okay. Uh, tell me, is it a hold or not to hold? Uh, can you suggest something better? Maybe granite REIT? Well, if you've held it for a long time, you certainly are making money, so that's confusing, because Rio Can has you know, done very, very well. It's been around for a long time, very strong management. They're in the retail space with this channel, a challenge, but they are in the process of adding several thousand apartment units. They will have the highest quality apartment portfolio uh, in Canada. Not yeah. the biggest, it's not gonna be that material to your question, Rio Can, but the dividend is solid, is strong management. Uh, I think it's something you can sleep at night with. All right, thank you so much. Let's get in one more call. Dave from Waterloo. Hi, Dave. Anita, and I'd just like to ask Jeffrey about Common R REIT sure. and the Quebec real estate market in general. Thank you. Thank you. Quebec real estate market has been improving. It looks pretty good. Mm. It's getting the attention of Americans right now. Common R is the vehicle to get exposure to that. Uh, there's been horrible problems with management. That's being changed. There's a new CFO. We think very highly of Heather Kirk that came from Bay Street. She knows what she's doing. They have a lot of stuff to work through. Uh, there's some activists there. Not our favorite name, uh, but if you want Quebec exposure, uh, you can get it through Comanar. 
All right, Jeffrey, thank you so much. Uh, you got uh, most of the calls in. We appreciate that. Thank you, every, everyone, for calling in. One more thing. The CEO of Allied Properties will be on the street tomorrow. Oh, right. Yes, with Perfect. Paul Bagnell. So there you go. Nice little tee-up courtesy of Jeffrey Olin. We're coming back. His top picks are straight ahead. We found out what Jeffrey Olin is uh, bullish on, uh, but let's get uh, a better idea now with respect to your top picks. Uh, number one, Canadian apartment rate. You really like this space right now. Yeah, it fits within the space we yeah. talked about. All the demographic and secular factors checks that box. Plus, in cap rate space, they are heavily concentrated in Toronto. <clears throat> so you're getting, uh, they, it's big, they have 41,500 residential units with about at least half their value driven by Toronto. So all of the uh, benefits, uh, all the immigration, uh, which has gone up significantly this country, they're benefiting from that, they're mm -hmm. benefiting the quality. They also, uh, so it's $7.8 billion market cap, new CEO, think very highly of him, Mark Kenny. They have the ability to develop 10,000 new apartment units, which they're now working on under Mark Kenny's stewardship. They own 11,000 manufactured housing community units, which nobody talks about, which is probably the best asset class in real estate. Ask Sam Zell about that in the United States, manufactured housing communities, fantastic asset class. They have a big presence in Netherlands, which I was over there at the end of June. They're going, they are the control the only pure play apartment entity in the Netherlands. This is a great read. It's very conservative. You can sleep at night with this. The division is safe and you get some growth from those pillars of development, manufactured housing community upside redevelopment, the Netherlands, as well as being Dublin, Ireland's only pure play apartment. Read. Dublin, this Ireland, I get. Netherlands, uh, a little bit random there, no? You know, uh, Netherlands is the third most po densely populated country on the planet. Really? Uh, there's a huge housing shortage there. There is no large scale institutional ownership of apartments. It is a very complex rental regime there. Capri is the perfect entity to figure that out and do well for the unit holders. All right. Uh, thank you for that, Jeffrey. Let's get to your uh, second top pick now. That would be AmeriCold Realty Trust. Cold on Nisey. Right. So this is a great, uh, you talk about moats, you don't see too many moats in real estate. We like moats. Uh, we, as we touched on, we love the industrial space. Well, here the specialized REIT within that space. They focus on temperature controlled warehouses. So food. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk about what's going on in the supply chain. Well, we now know ever, all the grocery stores chains are figuring out how to deal with e-commerce. E right. You have the trend to fresh food, ready to eat. This is all creating demand for what is mission critical. Mm -hmm. This isn't, you know, this is the largest temperature controlled uh, logistics real estate entity for food in the world and they're doing development they have the platform and it trades about the same multiple as the other u.s industrial reits but as twice the growth oh my goodness so this is a large holding provision we love this name it's highly liquid uh we have and we think there's going to be a secular change to the cap rates because it's specialized it has a higher cap rate a higher return cap but we think that's going to move down if a cap rate moves down the value of the real estate goes up and the value of your stock will go up accordingly. Okay, let's round this out. Uh, this one uh, piqued my interest uh, during the break. The Howard Hughes Corporation? This is a jewel, uh, $6 billion market cap, New York Stock Exchange listed. Uh, totally perfect vision name. It's a corporation, not a REIT. They pay no dividend. So it's not in the index funds and not in the REIT funds. It's completely self-funding. They don't need to raise capital from Wall Street. So they don't have the breadth of analyst coverage. They have Citigroup that covers it. They have Jefferies that covers it. Uh, worth $170 a share easily, uh, trading around 130. And they just announced in the last few weeks a strategic process to service that value. Extremely competent management team, highly aligned. The CEO wrote a check for $50 million to buy warrants exercisable at $125 a share. His cost base is 150 
The stock's 130. There's a guy that's aligned to serve as value for shareholders in very high quality assets. Uh, and why Howard Hughes? They own the original Howard Hughes lands in Las Vegas called yeah. Summerlin. City of 100,000 people. This yeah. is a this is a beautiful uh, beautiful name uh, for your investors or your your viewers, I should say, and our investors uh, to benefit from that upside. And this goes into what you were saying off the top of the show, right? We, we've seen the phenomenon well into play here uh, in Canada with respect to the uh, inner cities, the urban centers, call it what you will. But this is a play on that south of the border, right? Prime urban land holdings and in select major U.S. cities? Yeah, they have. The one that gets all the airtime is South Street Seaport in Manhattan, uh, Lower East Side. This is underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. They're redeveloping the old uh, seaport area. They've got ESPN's World Studios is on the fourth floor. They have Nike on the third floor. They have three very high restaurants. It gets a lot of sex appeal, but some of the assets, including building uh, condos in Hawaii, it's just incredible pieces of land. All right. Well, Jeffrey, I have to say it was an absolute pleasure uh, chatting. You know, I don't have too many people I can talk about real estate with without boring them. So this is uh, a lot of fun. I know our viewers uh, really enjoyed your analysis. Thank you for coming on. Sir. Thanks for having me. All right. He's Jeffrey Ola, and I'm Anita Sharma. That'll do it for this edition of Market Call. We'll see you tonight, 6 o'clock Eastern for Market Call tonight, the encore presentation of this